Hello again and welcome back to the Bible Project podcast. We're in episode 177, which is part 108 of season 2 on this massive, wonderful journey, hopefully through the whole Bible. And we are reached the point where we're jumping into a new chapter of Genesis, chapter 14, and we'll be looking at just the first four verses as a way of a sort of a scene set today. And the question I would like to open our time together with is by asking you the question, has God ever blessed you? If you're an unbeliever and you walk with the Lord, then I believe most of us should be able to answer yes to that question. In fact, maybe we should be able to answer it with a resounding yes. But here's my second, and it's the really big question today. If God has blessed you, how should you acknowledge it? How should you acknowledge Or better still, how should you respond to the blessings of God? Now, I want to make a suggestion uh, over these next few episodes of how we might and should do that. And I want to do it by looking at the events in this continuing story of Abraham as revealed in chapter 14. So let's look at this story together and to see how and when God blessed Abraham and how he responded. And we'll begin that by looking at the start of chapter 14, which uh, can seem a difficult text to read, but uh, I'll do my best. Okay, so Genesis 14, 1 to 4 says this. At the time when Am- Amaphrahel was king of Shinar and Arioch king of, king of Elsiar, Keo de Lomar king of Elam and the tidal king of Goyen, these kings went to war against Bera king of Sodom and Bishar, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Adma, Shemebim, king of Zehoiabim, and the king of Bela, this is Zohar. All these latter kings joined forces in the valley of Sidim, that is the Dead Sea Valley. For twelve years they had been subject to Keo de Lomar, but in the thirteenth year they rebelled. So at this point, Abraham is in Palestine, and at that time it is actually called Palestine because the land, it is the land of the Philistine tribes, and it hasn't been set aside yet as part of Israel, set aside for the nation of Israel. Palestine is bordered on the west by the Sea of Galilee, and as you move inland, you sort of go up a, a modest mountain range, and you find at that time a populated area called Salem, which will eventually become Jerusalem. Abraham is in this place called Hebron, which isn't too far from Jerusalem, and we are told we are told in the text that there are five kings in the south, down in the southern part of the Dead Sea area. So these opening verses, they're telling us about these five kings and also telling us about the cities they are connected with. Now, two of them you'll probably recognise straight away, but three of them I suspect you've never heard of. And interestingly, we won't hear of them again in the Bible. The two cities whose names you probably recognised are Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, I should point out that when it describes these people as kings, it is not talking about people who are leaders of nations. We are talking about smaller city-states of which these people are rulers, a local king, if you wish, over those cities. Now, interestingly, in 1918, a very famous Middle Eastern archaeologist called Albright, he wrote about this chapter and he said this, and this was his quote at that time. There is no foundation for us knowing or proving where these cities are. So that's 1918. And he also wrote that the historical view of this chapter has no foundation in archaeological evidence. And that's how things were in 1918. But listen to what this man wrote in 1955, the same man referencing the latest research that not only only he, but many others had done. He said this, this, Genesis chapter 14 can no longer be considered as unhistorical in view because of the many confirmation of details which we owe to our present finds. There is evidence that the cities mentioned are indeed real cities called Sodom and Gomorrah. So in 1955, it was recognized across many disciplines that these two cities were not only only existed, 
but they were identified where they were. Then later, after Albright actually himself had died, a 1973 survey of the same area said there were other cities in the area at that time, and it concluded that there were once five cities in the southern part of the Dead Sea region. Isn't that incredible? The Bible says there are five cities down there. There's no evidence to support that claim for hundreds, you might say thousands of years, until 1955, when two of them are identified. And then in 1973, they excavate further and they find another three in that area. I think that's absolutely incredible. But anyway, back to what the text says. These cities, it says, are subject to tax. Uh, really like paying tribute to the higher level kings of Babylon, which is of course modern day Iran and Iraq. And they do that for 12 years, we are told, but then in the 13th year, they rebel. They finally rebel, rebel and they decide we're not going to be taxed anymore. So that's the background to this chapter we're looking at over the next few days. Now we'll pick up the story in verse five and we'll look at the narrative of the four kings as they invade Palestine and discover what happens to them. And we'll also hopefully begin to discover what all this means because we have quite a bit of text to get through today. And we're picking up the story in verse five where we're given the route of the four Babylonian kings as they invade Palestine. So picking up at verse five, it says this, in the 14th year, Keo de Lomar and the kings allied with him went out and defeated the Raphaites in Ashtaroth Kernem, the Zuzites in Ham, the Emites in Shiva Kirthem, and the Horites in the hill country of Seir, as far as El Paran near the desert. They turned back and went to En Mizpah, that is Kadesh, and they conquered the whole territory or territory of the Amalekites, as well as the Amorites, who were living in Hazion Tamar. So these verses tell us that these four kings go directly out to the five cities, but first of all, they pick off the neighbors before going on to engage the five main cities, because they didn't want the neighbors taking advantage of this situation. So the text then continues in verse eight and says this, then the king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah, the king of Adma, the king of Zephoim, and the king of Bela, that is Zor, marched out and drew battle lines in the valley of Sidon against Caodilumar, king of Edom, Tidal, king of Goem, Arafel, king of Shinar, and Arioch, king of Elishar. Four kings against five there. Now the valley of Sidon was full of tar pits, and when the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, some of the men fell into them, and the rest fled to the hills. The four kings seized all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah, and all their food, and they went away. They also carried off Abraham's nephew Lot and his possessions, since he was living in Sodom. So, beginning in verse 8, we are basically told that they engaged in a battle, and that the five kings probably assumed that they weren't going to get conquered by this lesser army of four kings. They probably really thought they had the numerical advantage. But we see that once the battle begins, it's the four kings who win, and the five king army and their armies are fleeing the battlefield, and some get bogged down in tar pits. So the five kings are not just declared seem to be defeated, they're utterly defeated in a horrible and catastrophic way. Someone once said it seemed to be poetic justice because Sodom and Gomorrah were vile and filthy in the way they lived and now die in a vile and filthy way also. But did you notice that the victorious kings also seize Lot? And now we see, have seen that he must have been living in Sodom and they, the, 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 the victorious kings, they seize him and his goods and they depart. So they take Lot and we might, and we can assume his entire family to make slaves of them. Lot is captured by the winning armies and Abraham now has the job to go off and try and rescue him. And that's what the rest of this chapter will be about. 
So the next part of the passage that I'll read is the second part, which tells us about the intervention of Abraham. So picking up on the text in verse 13, it says this. A man who had escaped from and reported this to Abraham, the Hebrew. Now Abraham was living near the great trees of Mamre, the Am Amoite, a brother of Eshcol and Aner, all of whom were allied with Abram. Abram heard that his relative had been taken captive, and he called out the 318 men born in his household and went in pursuit as far as Dan. During the night, Abraham divided his men to attack them, and he routed them, pursuing them as far as Hobah, north of Damascus. He recovered all the goods and brought back his relative Lot and his possessions, together with the women and the other people. After Abraham returned from de defeating Caodilomer and the kings allied with him, the king of Sodom came out to meet him in the valley of Sheva, that is the king's valley. Now, I did say at the beginning uh, a few of uh, this sort of section of scripture, a few uh, bit back, a couple of chapters back, that some of the events in these scriptures uh, really challenge the modern mindset. Now, the result that is considered good here, the one where we see the rout of the armies of Sodom and Gomorrah, from an Old Testament perspective, are portrayed as a good thing. So we can certainly say that something considered good isn't portrayed or can anyway be represented as a sort of weakness or an inability to fight. It's a, it's a sort of strength that we see here that it, it enables Abraham, when he finds out that his, his nephew has been kidnapped in this terrible war, it enables him to have the presence of mind and the strength to mount and arm a team of just over 300 people and literally go probably to hell and back to try and rescue him. Now, this is a sort of a, a real strength, isn't it? It's not something that would line up equally with the word meekness as often described and used to characterize the Christian faith. There is that great line in the New Testament, the meek shall inherit of the earth, and it's in the Sermon on the Mount. And whatever is going on here doesn't really, to the modern mind sense, seem to have an, an attitude of meekness. But you may remember that when I referenced the story of Noah, Back, I spent a lot of time considering what this word meekness meant when used in the Old Testament. Because I think, I, I sort of feel that our natural reaction to think about people being meek, meek is that we, meek people will get walked over. So I spent a lot of time looking at commentaries and looking at both the Greek and the Hebrew root of the word meek as it appears in the New Testament and in the words of Christ to try and figure out what's really going on here when you set it aside events like this in the whole testament so what i discovered was that meek does not mean meek in the modern sense that we have it it's completely wrong meekness as displayed in the words of Christ and in the teaching of the new testament epistles is about having strength under control those who have a spiritual strength but know how to use it by keeping in a sense their power sheathed and it's those people it says will inherit the earth and that's a very different idea of the idea of meekness james when talking about it talks about a bridle in a horse's mouth as something that is restraining an amazing amount of strength and power so it's strength under control so the normal idea of of Christians or even Jesus himself being meek and mild and that you take that attitude to like things will go well for you. I don't believe that's the right perspective here at all. That doesn't fit with the reality of the life of most people on this earth and it certainly doesn't fit with the biblical narrative here. So verse, verse 13 tells us that when uh, someone escapes from this situation and they go across and they find Abraham and they tell him what has happened and the, they, it says they tell Abraham and then it says Abraham the Hebrew what has happened now this is interesting because this is, this is the first time the word Hebrew appears in the Bible remember Abraham is a Hebrew because he's descended from Eber and another thing is that might grab your attention is the fact that he, uh, he is armed with only 318 men and yet he still goes off in pursuit of Lot against these two armies, large armies who've just been victorious. 
It also says he went by night and that the enemy for forces had just conquered these cities. So some historians have pointed out the fact that that meant that the enemy armies would have been loaded down with plunder and they were also heading home having had their victory so the last thing they would have expected would have been for someone to attack them particularly at night one commentary I, I read said the soldiers were probably drunk because they were celebrating and the last thing they would have been expected would have been a stealth attack by night but this will not be the only time in the bible that we will see a large army defeated by god's anointed people the story of Gideon in the book of Judges will be just as dramatic as this. So there are lessons here and I think the lessons are clear. God is able to give a trusting and obedient minority of people great victories over large ungodly forces, even over situations where they feel there, there is an overwhelming superiority in numbers lining up against them. As someone once said, which I think is a beautiful way of summarizing this, one plus the Lord will always be a majority in every situation. So here we see Abraham go and rescue Lot. And verse 16 tells us that he not only rescues Lot, but he, that he brings him back and all his goods and all his relatives with him as well. Then Abraham chases the invaders all the way back up to Hobah, which is north of Damascus, which is in modern day Syria. So, so far we've looked at two things in this chapter. First of all, an invasion and a battle and the, and the taking of Lot and then Abraham's, in, Abraham's intervention into that situation. Remember where we're up to so far, we've looked at two things in this chapter. We've seen that there's been a war between regional kings and that Lot fell into captivity and it took the intervention of Abraham to, uh, to rescue him. But I have one more thing I'd like to say, and I'm going to call it Abraham's insight and how it gives us an understanding of what's going on. At the end of yesterday's study, we finished in verse 17, and this character, the king of Sodom, had come out, and now we're going to pick up the text in chapter 14, verse 18, which says this. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine, he was priest of God Most High, and he blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, and praise be to God Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Now, this is interesting because Melchizedek, the king of Salem, brings out bread and wine. That's a familiar motif, isn't it, to Christians? And we are also told that he is the priest of the Most High God. So is there any significant the significance to Melchizedek being the king of Salem and the fact that Salem will later become uh, the city of Jerusalem? This is interesting because these verses seem to indicate that the per person being presented here is someone who is very important and someone who already absolutely knows and identifies with the one true God Most High. And that God, as well as being most high, is described as being the creator of heaven and earth. So Abraham meets Melchizedek, king of Salem, and Melchizedek is then seen to bless Abraham. Melchizedek is presented as a king and a priest. Well, let's look and see what happens next. Let's pick up the text in verse 21. It tells us this. Then Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. The king of Sodom said to Abraham, give me the people and keep the goods for yourself. But Abraham said to the king of Sodom, with raised hands I have sworn an oath to the Lord God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, that I will accept nothing belonging to you, not even a thread or the strap of a sandal, so you, that you will never be able to say, I made Abraham rich. I will accept nothing but what my men have eaten and the share which belongs to the men who went with me, to Ener, Eshcol and Mamre. Let them have their share. Well, this is interesting. In verse 20, uh, it says Abraham gave Melchizedek a tithe, a tenth of everything. 
He meets this guy who comes out of nowhere and he immediately gives him 10% of all the spoils he has taken in this war that has just taken place. Abraham is returning from his victory over the four kings and he's flush with success. And Abraham now could be expected in some way to sort of throw his weight around and boast about his victory. Particularly if he met another king from another city-state, having just conquered and defeated these others. Abraham could maybe would have even been justified uh, at this point to consolidate his conquest of Canaan. But no, Abraham does none of these things. Instead, he acknowledges the greatness of this person standing before him and presents him with a tenth of all his possessions. That's his response. He gives Melchizedek a tithe of all his resources. You see, the conquering Abraham had the right to the spoils of war. He had the right to take everything, but instead he presents the king with a tithe of everything that he has received. So let's listen to Abraham's response. Abraham said to the king of Solomon, Sodom, I have raised my hand to the Lord Most High, the possessor of heaven and earth, and I will take nothing from a thread to a sandal strap. This is a can be a difficult and confusing scripture, but the heart of it lies in the fact that Abraham is making another sacrifice here. He's done this incredibly brave thing. He's rescued his not not. He's rescued his nephew Lot, and he's rescued the king's goods. And that king appears before him and says, and he has offered a reward, and he says, I'm not going to take that reward. He doesn't want to benefit inappropriately from doing just what he believed was the right thing and from doing the thing that the covenant promise of God would have required of him to do. So it's another testament to Abraham's developing character that he's refusing to benefit from his actions, except in taking back what was rightly his and was rightly due to the men who went with him. In other words, Abraham decided that he wanted God's blessing more than he wanted the benefits of any war. And that stands in stark contrast to the Abraham who previously we met, the one who previously went into Egypt, the one who went into Egypt and worked to gain material wealth from Pharaoh. Remember, all the wealth he gained in Egypt he had he still left with ended up with nothing but now he gains everything and he takes nothing so abraham is definitely growing spiritually friends one commentator said that abraham now stands out as a man who knew he only prospered because of god's blessing so that's the story of what this chapter is about when foreign kings invade the land abraham intervenes and rescues lot and has a great victory but when he does so this time he acknowledges uh, God's blessing and after refusing to receive the worldly benefits of that war he instead chooses to give a tithe to this person called Melchizedek now we could spend the whole time today talking about who this Melchizedek is and was theologians over thousands of years have come up with all kinds of theories as just to who Melchizedek is and many ancient Jews and a number of modern commentators would actually argue that he is the pre-incarnate Messiah. And that is a perfectly valid point of view. But I'm choosing not to go into that today because I want us to talk about how this story and how it revolves around two people and the great contrast within the chapter of Lot and Abraham. So I'm, I'm wanting rather to focus on that, to focus on where this story fits into the big narrative of Abraham's story in Genesis. In chapter 13, we must remember that Lot gold got, went and pitched his tent near Sodom, towards Sodom, it says, facing Sodom, so we could see it if you read the King James Version. And by the time we get to chapter four, we see he's actually living in Sodom. And consequently, because of that choice and those actions, he ends up a prisoner of war when this local uh, war breaks out and his property, property is confiscated and his whole family is captured. He followed, Lot followed his earthly lusts and he was utterly brought down. But on the other hand, the story is now telling us that Abraham is becoming more and more unselfishly 
Unselfishly, we saw that he let Lot choose the best land in chapter 13, but here he still ends up victorious in chapter 14. And when blessed, he acknowledges God's blessing, and he does so practically, physically, by tithing. He, Lot, you see, took the path of unrighteousness and ended up defeated, but Abraham took the path of righteousness and ended up in victory. He ended up living in peace and honour and with blessing. But the great lesson of this episode is that when Abraham was blessed by God, he acknowledged God's blessing in his life. We're closing this section on acknowledging the goodness of God in the life of Abraham in Genesis chapter 14. And we're in the closing part of this section. And I began this section covering Genesis 14 by asking if God had ever blessed you. And if so, how should, uh, how should you, how should we respond to the blessings of God? How do we acknowledge the blessings of God in our lives? Well, it's the conclusion of this passage, uh, looking at four, chapter 14. And I want to, to summarize by giving us three suggestions of how we might do that. Number one is I believe we should always remember to give thanks. But what I mean by that is in, that is in all situations, count the blessings of God, number the blessings as it has been said. In other words, take note of them and give thanks for them each and every time they occur. Do that always, friends. Secondly, be like Abraham and honour the Lord in front of other people. When God does something good in your life, credit the Lord for it and credit it in front of other people. As Abraham's spiritual maturity grew, he made no bones about the fact that it was God who had blessed him. And he did that in front of other people. He bore witness to the blessings of God and we should do that always. Included in the way he responded to God's blessing is the fact that he let other people know what God had done in his life and he did that all the time. And that's the kind of thing that Abraham did and that's the kind of thing that we need to do also. So firstly, we are to give thanks, but secondly, we are to acknowledge that those blessings came from the Lord himself. The third thing that we saw he did in the last couple of episodes was that he tithed. He gave. He gave of his resources. He gave of his personal resources and his financial resources. Now that's an invitation to preach on giving, isn't it, right? But I'm going to say no more than that, than this is the fact that the Lord loves a cheerful giver and that we are called upon in the Bible to give generously proportionally and cheerfully. But also underpinning all of that is the vitally important thing that we must give with the right attitude. You see, friends, the bottom line here in the Old Testament clearly and also in the New Testament is that God is more interested in what is in your heart and the way in which you give than the amount that is in your hand. But we, the overarching principles are that we should give generously proportionally and cheerfully. If you're giving a full 10% of all your income and you're doing that begrudgingly, then that will not please the Lord. And he says so, it says so specifically in 2 Corinthians. So don't give grudgingly, friends, but what you give, give willingly. And sometimes when we give, we have to acknowledge the fact that what we give is primarily to be spent on others. Some people, they give generously to church, but they only do that when they see it spent in the way they expect it to be spent, or they only give generously if they see that it is being used to maintain or support the thing that they enjoy doing at church or are involved in a church. But that's not the way to give at all, friends. Remember, Always the church is the only organization in the world that exists for the benefit of other people. The church exists for the benefit of those who are not part of it yet, who have not come into that family yet. And we should remember our giving is not just to support the things that we really enjoy doing at church. Remember the Lord, so always remember the Lord wants you to give generously, generously, 
proportionally, happily, some might say even sacrifice, sacrificially, in order that he can do a new thing amongst his people. We leave it there for this time and then we'll pick up next time in Genesis chapter 15 in this life of Abraham and we'll consider in the next few podcasts the idea of the reliability of God as illustrated in these stories of Abraham.